I'm Andrea Lewandowski, and welcome to NJSL Live. We're broadcasting live from the New Jersey Maker Summit. And to tell us a little bit more before I show off some of the really neat robotics uh, equipment that's here today, I'm going to introduce Doug Baldwin to tell us a little bit hey, more. Buddy. <laughs> Hi, so, um, yeah, welcome to the New Jersey Maker Summit. Glad you could join us virtually. Um, we're in the middle of our break right now, but I just want to very briefly talk about what the summit is and what we're trying to accomplish today. So, the New Jersey Maker Summit, it was an idea that uh, sort of came about from our working group, the NJ Makers, which is sort of a loose consortium of different facilitators um, here within New Jersey for museums, libraries, academics, schools. And really what we wanted to do was have a place where people could come together and talk about the different issues within the maker movement here in New Jersey and be able to sort of network and uh, discuss different ideas. So um, one of the ideas that really came to the forefront for us and immediately talked about what we wanted to do as far as a theme uh, for our event was social responsibility. Um, we believe that the maker movement can really be an active catalyst for being able to do really important um, sort of community building, community helping work in you know, um, areas like um, assistive technologies, helping to solve community, community problems, helping to deal with equity and access uh, within making, uh, within communities to different types of resources. So what we really wanted to do is sort of convene a group to really talk about those issues, sort of flesh those out, and then we'll be able to share that out with, really, with everybody. Um, we were fortunate enough to get a Nation of Makers uh, Town Hall grant to be able to sort of put on this event today, which we're very thankful for. And, um, you know, we thank NJ Makers Day, uh, the New Jersey Makers and Rutgers University for hosting us today. And I think the conversations are going great. I know the one that I was in on collaboration partnerships was. Um, and hopefully we'll continue to have really great conversations this afternoon. Afternoon, but I know what you really came to see were the robots, so I'm going to turn it back over to Andrea so you guys can see the cool stuff that they brought from uh, New Jersey City University. All right, great. So let's see some robots. Who wants to go first? Hi. <laughs> Here we go. These are the Cubelats. I'm Barbara McCarty. Um, these are basic robot blocks. They um, you have to put them together. You need one that senses, one that thinks, and one that acts. So um, this one has a um, distance sensor, so when I put something close to it, it'll turn the light on and move, and it's a great way for the kids to um, see that every piece that they put together is going to change what it does and do some critical thinking and see how it's going to react. That's excellent. Thank you. All right, who's next? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Laszlo Bacorny. And, uh, and this is Edith Adeyomi Bamba. Okay. How we are, are you? from New Jersey City University, a doctoral program in education technology leadership. And uh, we're introducing and showcasing the LEGO EV3 uh, robots and the so software, the programming software. Uh, as you know, the STEAM program, we, know, we need a lot of people to, do, uh, to go into the STEM uh, field. So creating this robot and uh, building it to use to do math, science, technology, most students will be able to be interested in the field program. So now well, there's approximately 551 pieces wow. set. So imagine all the set cost at least 300 something dollars, mm -hmm. but it's very useful in math, technology, for especially for those that don't enjoy doing the calculation, they can see a hands-on activity, they can create stuff and make it move coding and so on and so forth. That's excellent. We have three models here today, uh, all programmed to do different functions. Uh, the first one is programmed to accomplish a task of moving the little object over here back and forth. So we have a back movement and a forward movement. Okay. And then we have another one programmed to have a rear sensor uh, reaction. So when it moves forward, excuse me. or when it moves backward and it touches something, see, it moves back forward afterwards. Okay, so there's a, there's a sensor built into it that stops it. Very cool. All right, and then of course the big guy over here, he is um, 
he is programmed with a, a bunch of sensors, but uh, we'll, we'll demonstrate the, um, excuse me, we'll demonstrate the uh, number four. So when he detects an object, Ooh. he defends <laughs> and then reverses his, his path. Very nice. Okay. So, thank you very much. Thank you thank very so much. much. Yeah. I got you. Hi. Hello. How are you? Good. All right. So my demonstration was on the Spiro. It's this robot right over here. I'll put it on the floor. I'll put out the code that I wrote in a moment. But basically, you look down here. My entire, um, the entire concept here is just predicated on the idea that math is, uh, it's not necessarily real. There are like two philosophies that people uh, adhere to when it comes to math. One is mathematical realism that math is, you know, it's happening all around us and that we have to discover these concepts. Mm -hmm. um, but the other one is that math mathematical anti-realism or fictionalism, which basically posits that math isn't real and that we as humans, because we want to explore, because we want to create, we, we develop problems that can only be solved, that we have to create a method to solve those problems and that method is math. So in any case, well, regardless of what philosophy you adhere to, um, we, we have to teach math in a way that replicates the contexts in which they're used. So I have right over here, with like coding, I bring up like the self-parking vehicles. And you, know, you, you would probably use a coding language like Python or C++, which would involve some math in order for it to do certain things given, given uh, certain circumstances. So you could, comp you, could, uh, you could basically simulate that on a smaller scale with the Sphero. And uh, the Sphero, the, the coding language is also more basic. It's a, it's a drag and drop coding language, which basically simplifies text-based coding. And the program that I have, you can look at it in, in the text space as well. But basically, and come back down here again, what I did was, and I have a video on this as well, if you guys want to watch the video, just uh, just look at my YouTube page. It's A, capital A, and then my last name, Izad, E, like Edward, Z, like Zebra, A, like Adam, and D, like David. And you'll see this video up here in which I play out the actual activity. But basically, if you zoom in on that, I, I constructed an assignment in which you would have to uh, park the Sphero, so, so to speak. Write a code in which the Sphero would have to park in between these two objects. Like pretend that this is a car and pretend that this is another car. And that Sphero is the rear of the vehicle. So I wanted to simulate the actual motion of a car, so I wanted to go back and diagonal. Now these two books, they form like a rectangular shape, and in order to determine how many degrees I want the Sphero to use, I had to use trigonometry concepts to determine the angle of this like uh, imaginary triangle that I put there. So I'm basically using trig and geometry to write code. Now my code wasn't perfect, but you know, as with coding and as with math, you might get your calculations wrong the first time, and then you could have to you have to go back and check uh, to see what went wrong. It's also something that students should be doing when they're practicing math, as per the Common Core and NJSLS standards. So I started it, and it was it wasn't facing the right direction. <laughs> so I'm going to stop it really quickly. I'm going to aim it. So anyway, if you want, that's the code that I wrote. It's very basic. So I wanted to move back 180 degrees. Uh, move diagonally 140 degrees and then that's what I, the number I came up with after doing all the trigonometry calculations and then back 180 degrees again. So once I aim it, I want the blue tail light to be facing backwards. So that tail light right there has to be facing there. And now I just play out my code. I'm going to move it a little bit over. So it moved diagonally the way I wanted it to, but it was going too far. So that just tells me that I have to change the number of seconds that it's rolling for. Mm -hmm. But in any case, I have the angle right. So right. even though I didn't meet all of the criteria of the assignment there, I still got most of it, and I'm also applying a, ma a complex math concept that would otherwise be completely abstract. Excellent. All right. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. Hi. 
Hi. Hello. So here's where um, I'm Stephanie from Fort Worth. Um, I'm actually from New York. I live in Worcester okay. County, and I'm here today um, to talk about also here. Yeah. So the also are so really great for STEM, but they have so many different applications. Like you can um, apply them to any discipline. Um, I actually just saw a lesson that uses them. Um, there's basic coding. More students are going to use different colors that the Ozobots can identify, and it tells them to do different things. Uh, they also work with um, Google Block, and which is a block coding, and they can also actually see the the actual coding language. So they can. You have different three different levels of coding. You have a very basic with the colors. You can use block coding, and then you can actually do the actual language coding. Okay, very cool. Excellent. Thank you. And we have a drone here. Can I just keep talking? Is it? Wait, we'll introduce yourself. Okay. I'm Alex Cruziola. I'm an environmental science teacher at Livingston High School. And today I'm demonstrating some drones. Okay, cool. Um, here on the right is what is known as the Phantom 4. It's, it's a fairly high end drone. Um, and in my right hand is what we call the Mavic. It's, it's also a fairly high end drone, but it's also foldable. So not only are drones getting more sophisticated and cheaper, but they're getting more compact as well. And I was just telling Michelle that when you are flying them, you know, flying them is fun, flying them is great, um, but what makes them so attractive to uh, consumers and to teachers is the camera that's on board that takes very high resolution imagery, uh, but also the telemetry data that comes in uh, on your device when you're flying it. So when you're flying it, it will give you obviously the basics like speed, altitude, acceleration. It will also give you uh, your flight path, which is traced out uh, on Google Maps, for example. Uh, and really from there, it gives you a wealth of data. It's kind of up to you to decide how you want to use that, depending on uh, you know, if you're a physics teacher, you're probably going to want those, the numerical data, the speed, acceleration, angle of attack, all that stuff, you know, a lot more than I would in an environmental science setting. Not that those numbers aren't great, but, you know, I'm more of a, in the biological field, so I'm more interested in using the imagery to calculate urban sprawl, for example, or examine watersheds, you know, seeing, uh, you know, calculating deforestation, and, you know, all, all those kinds of things that are that, that all depend on a really good camera in front. Uh, now, all, now, both of these are pretty high ends, meaning that they do have a pretty high price point. Uh, but the technology is, is coming down in price, as things always do. Uh, drones are getting simpler. Uh, they're getting smaller. Uh, they're getting more user friendly. They're, they're becoming more foolproof as well. So. You know, th this drone, for example, will not let me fly it forward into a wall. Okay, that's good. Um, which is a good thing. <laughs> nice. yeah. uh, but it will only prevent me from flying it forward into a wall. It does not have those same sensors in the back. Mm -hmm. you know, the newer ones do. So it'll it'll uh, keep you from flying into a wall on four sides. It will prevent you from flying into the ceiling. It will prevent you from slamming it into the ground. Uh, so, you know, it, it's incremental technology like smartphones are. You know, every time a new iteration comes out, there's a new gee whiz kind of sensor um, you know, that, that just kind of makes it cooler but obviously right now in education the trick is you know, how do you take you know one or two of these in a classroom and engage everybody right uh, because not everyone's going to have one and if it's one person flying it what does everybody else do because the novelty wears off pretty quickly once the drone sort of disappears in the clouds uh, what is everyone else doing? I guess everybody else should be, you know, looking at the data, tracking everything that's happening, throwing that into itself, making a data set, you know. Right. Yeah. And you know, the nice thing is that, I mean, this, this image, I, it's probably not 4K, at least not pretty that darn beam clear. to it. It's yeah. pretty clear. This will be this clear even a mile away. Yeah. You know, the antennas that are built into these are incredible. I can't, I can't believe I cannot believe the visuals we get from the one that we, that we get. Yeah. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you very much. Can I show you a humanoid robot? Sure.